Um, so good morning, um, everyone, and welcome to um, the guest speaker series of um, our uh, study of Iola Leroy. Uh, today we have joining us uh, Professor Bridget Fielder, and she will be speaking about um, uh, mixed race heroin fiction as a genre and, and the ways in which um, Harper is challenging um, with her novel, which uh, we've talked about how the novel uh, Harper is is working with many different genres, but in particular, how this her book can be seen as an anti-passing novel, and how um, in doing that she's challenging some of those tropes in mixed race heroin fiction. And students, we've talked about the trope, uh, meaning like rep repeating patterns and uh, that we can see um, in literature across literature. So I did want to mention that we have a Padlet. I'm going to ask. Um, uh, Sarai to drop it again in the chat for students to and guests to leave comments, questions for the speaker. Um, students, at this time, I do need you to turn on cameras, uh, make sure, making sure that we, um, you know, are present fully um, during this session. And I encourage you to use the chat to uh, make connections to the text, to pose questions. I will be uh, jotting down, um, you know, summaries and um, you know moments during I'll be note taking throughout the chat so that you can kind of like follow along in terms of how um, I'm breaking down um, the talk. It's not meant to be a, a super formal lecture. I really do want you to engage with Professor Fielder who is generously uh, um, zooming in uh, from Wisconsin today. So um, thank you again and um, welcome. Great, thanks very much. Um, so today I just wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about um, mixed race heroin fiction as a genre and how Harper's anti-passing novel fits into this genre um, and also some important revisions that she makes uh, to these popular tropes. So for the first part of this, I'll share, share my screen um, mostly just to show you a few images. Oh, I don't have screen sharing. Sorry, let me just do that. Okay. Um, yeah, you should have it now. Okay. Hmm. Not yet. No, let's see. No. Okay, let me try that one more time. Oh, wait, yes. Okay. So I do. Okay. I, I've got it, I think, now. So you should be able to see. Um, these these pictures, right? Um, it's coming. Up. I'm, I might have slow internet too. This is. I'm just really praying internet doesn't hit down on me. Yes, now we see it. Okay, great. So this is just a few illustrations. Um, so um, I work mostly on uh, 19th and some early, uh, some late 18th century. Um, at, African American literature, um, uh, but this genre is actually a genre that works transatlantically and is going to be present in other places um, of the Black diaspora. So because the US system of slavery especially followed, um, children followed the condition of the mother, um, people could be legally enslaved no matter who their father was. Um, as with, say, the enslaved children of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, and no matter what they looked like, um, uh, as with um, even visibly white mixed race people. So um, because um, mixed race people are a fact of transatlantic slavery, um, we can see how mixed race characters appear in a wealth of literature in the 18th and 19th century, in places um, uh, in the Caribbean, in um, uh, British, French, and Spanish colonies, uh, and in the United States, uh, where slavery was a thing. So this begins with a figure of uh, the free mixed race concubine in literature by white British authors of the 18th century. We can see an example of this um, uh, in a couple of these tales, a woman of color and anonymously published text published in uh, London in 1808. And these figures often 
depended upon the hypersexualization of mixed race black women uh, and on their proximity to white people, either because they were free women of color who might have benefited materially from relationships with wealthy, wealthy white men or because their enslaved labor was done in domestic spaces that made them vulnerable to sexual harassment and assault. Now in 19th century US literature, these figures varied over the course of the century. And these are just a few examples of where we can see mixed race heroines in the 19th century by both um, white and black authors. Um, in 19th century English literature, these were not always sympathetic characters but there were often figures who revealed um, the author's anti-Black racism, um, like in Thackeray's um, depictions of Rhonda Swift, for example, in Vanity Fair. Um, at times, they illustrated the limited social and economic mobility of free mixed race Black people. Uh, but in the antebellum period, this figure really, really picks up um, in anti-slavery literature in particular, which would produce a wide range of literature around mixed race figures, their racial identification, and their enslavability. So the most prominent version of this trope is what's sometimes called the tragic mulatta trope, visible in American, French, um, in British, and Spanish fiction. And this extends from the 18th to the 19th century um, and into the 20th century as well. Now the tragic version of the mixed race heroine um, in the vast majority of US fiction was the child of an enslaver man and an enslaved woman. Sometimes this is a man um, figure, but in the US and English literatures, um, the woman version of this is, is more prominently depicted. These characters are almost always legally enslaved. They follow the conditions of their mothers. They were sometimes better educated than the other black people in their community. They often worked and lived in close proximity to white people and therefore became the targets of sexual harassment and assault. Sometimes these figures are raped or commit suicide in order to avoid being raped. Um, in some of the most prominent versions of this story, this woman meets a perfectly nice white man who opposes slavery and wants to marry her, but for whatever reason, either he can't buy her away from her enslavers or he does, but then he dies before he's able to give her or her children their legal freedom or he doesn't have his paperwork in order. Um, these things don't pan out for these tragic figures. So these stories often ended with the character suicide or death, the supposed tragedy being um, fit for white society in some way, but unable to escape their biological and legal ties to slavery. And this of this trope has often been correct. Um, this figure is even more prominent in anti-slavery literature where both white and black authors often used these mixed race figures and especially light skinned uh, white passing ones um, to garner sympathy for a presumably racist white audience who might be anti-slavery, but who were hesitant to give sympathy to dark skinned black characters. Um, and so uh, these assumptions weren't actually wrong. Most white anti-slavery advocates in the United States and England were racist. They did not believe in black equality. But still, um, even though this strategy for writing these characters was pragmatic, um, these white looking uh, mixed race characters are overrepresented in the most popular anti-slavery writing um, that's been studied over the past several decades um, from the 18th 30s through the 1850s, especially during the antebellum period leading up to the Civil War by writers like Harriet Beecher Stowe, Lydia Mia Child, um, and by black writers like William Wells Brown. And here we have uh, the figure of Eliza Harris in an illustration from uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the most popular um, novel of the century. So later in early 20th century literature and film, we're gonna see more representations of mixed race characters um, who intentionally pass as white, either in order to have some kind of social and economic advantage that they could not have had as black people or in order to avoid anti-black violence. However, the vast majority of mixed race black people in the United States do not pass for white, um, even if they are light skinned enough to do so. And when we understand race um, as part of uh, mixed race people as part of black communities, we can better understand how this happens, why most mixed race black people would not prioritize white family members over black ones, 
or attempt to or be able to pass as white. So here I have an example of Ellen and William Craft um, from the 1860s. Both of these people um, are enslaved, um, Ellen and William. Um, Ellen is light enough to pass for white and they escape from slavery by her passing as an enslaved man and him passing as the person who is enslaved by her. He is not able to pass for white. Now alone, um, Ellen Craft might be mistaken for a white woman as you can see in this uh, photograph uh, of her. But with her husband, um, she is not. And so we can see how those kinship relationships then um, are gonna complicate um, how these mixed race figures are functioning in the world. Um, so among the predominantly white field of literary scholars, conversations around mixed race heroines um, has often been dominated by this tragic version of the story um, this idea of racial passing um, and such discussions have often prioritized mixed race characters relationships to white people, to a white family member or with white romantic interests or even um, with regard um, to uh, the threat um, of white sexual violence, um, rather than focusing on their relationships to black people. And so these discussions have also tended to exclude the writing of black women. Um, in the larger genres of mixed race heroine fiction. So when we do actually look at black women's writing, the mixed race her black heroine does different things than this tragic trope that becomes the kind of dominant way a lot of scholars have talked about this. And so in black women's fiction, especially, these women don't overwhelmingly commit suicide and they don't even always die. Uh, they don't always choose white men as romantic interests. Um, they exist in relationships to other Black people. They live in Black families and as members of Black communities. And so reading Black women's fiction like Harper's gives us a different view of the genre um, and of these literary tropes. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing now because that's the end of the, the images that I have for you. Um, and we can uh, pause if there are any questions here about um, this larger genre of fiction before I go on um, to talk about um, Harper's anti-passing novel and some of the important um, adjustments she makes to contribute to uh, this genre and the trope of the mixed race black protagonist. Hey, um... I'm going to, uh, so students, if you want to ask a question, and I was just going to, um, even in that like short bit, I think you guys are getting a sense really of, of how a college level, you know, um, uh, class might feel like, you know, where you have a lot of important terms and, um, but you know, how you are able to break it down as a big part of your, um, the learning that needs to happen. And, and if, if your professor actually pauses and, and gives you time to ask questions, it's actually a really important time for you to engage. So um, I just wanted to make sure some students, because uh, there were some words here that I, I'd like them to maybe, um, maybe if you could clarify. So, um, so, so the like a, the the main um, figure of the tragic mulatto, mulatto trope, mulatto trope, and, but before that, the free mixed race concubine, those are, those are names of different kinds of uh, figures that would come up in this fiction and students. And so what we're trying to see is why are they, um, you know, how are they represented usually and why are they, you know, what are the purposes for the representation of these characters? Um, and, um, and how does it make a difference uh, when, you know, Harper steps in and she has a mixed race protagonist? How is it kind of like challenging some of these um, other ways? So students, do you have any questions um, about Prof Professor Fielder at this point in time? Um, I would like to ask a question. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, well, Professor Fielder, uh, you mentioned that it's a trope uh, the tragic trope of the mixed race woman and how her story ends, whereas Lola Leroy is the opposite of that. You know, she ends up uh, with a sort of quote unquote happy ending. She ends up with someone, she ends up with a good with her career. Um, why would why would it be easier to write stories about characters like Lola Leroy herself 
situation? Why would it be easier for someone to write tragic stories about them instead of writing endings that give hope and give, you know, happy endings? Why would it be easier to write these characters that, that die at the end or that tragically, that something tragic happens to them? Um, yeah, I found that I find I find that really interesting where it's where everything has to be tragic for someone every everything has to something ha bad has to happen at the end and it can't be happy for everyone um so yeah yeah that's a great question so um the way that people, so the kinds of stories, so all of these different, um, you know, kinds of characters that I'm talking about will dictate in some way the kind of story uh, that we're telling, right? And so if you have a story about, say, like, um, there's a princess um, and, you know, she wants something that she can't have, but then she eventually meets a prince and, you know, they, they live up happily ever. We kind of know what that's, what kind of story that's going to be when we meet this character at the beginning, right? And so if you're watching a different kind of story, something like Frozen, right? Um, and like that guy doesn't turn out to be a great guy. Um, we can see how that flips the script and turns that into a different kind of story just by virtue of what kind of character that is. So, um, you know, so, uh, you know, Hans of the Southern Isles then gets to be like not, uh, you know, the, the prince that's, you know, going to be um, a happy romantic figure, um, but he's a villain, <laughs> right? And that changes the kind of story that we're in. Um, and so, the vast majority of the kinds of stories that we get told around mixed race heroin fiction um, are people focusing on um, stories that are anti-slavery stories published in the few decades before the Civil War in the antebellum period from the 1830s through the 1850s leading up to the war. And the version of that story is that, you know, there's this, um, a woman who looks white as any white woman, but she is enslaved. And isn't it terrible that this white woman is also enslaved? And don't you know white women? And don't you care about white women? And this white woman is white as your sister, white as your daughter, white as your mother. And isn't slavery a system that would enslave even this white looking white woman? Terrible. <laughs> and so we can see how that kind of story would be um, compelling to someone who might um, not actually care about black people, but who might not want um, people. It's, it's trying to um, garner sympathy from a particular kind of audience. And if we see this tragedy, oh my goodness, um, you know, things did not work out for this person. <laughs> Um, this whole system is terrible. Even if individual white people try to help this person, they can't fix this system. We need to get rid of this system in which um, even someone um, who uh, has any amount of black ancestry can be enslaved. This is obviously wrong, right? Um, and so that kind of literature was serving a particular purpose. Um, it was making assumptions about an audience um, and both white and black authors wrote those kinds of stories, tragic stories about mixed race heroines who are enslaved for whom things did not work out despite any efforts by any nice white people because it doesn't matter how many individual nice white people there are in the system if this whole system is based on horrifying uh, oppression, right? Um, now, Harper is not writing an anti-slavery novel. She's writing a piece of historical fiction. So um, fiction about a different, set in a specific time period, but slavery as a question is already settled for her. And so this is actually, I think a really good segue to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the work that happens in this later period after the war. So Harper does some interesting work to revise this mixed race heroine in Iola Leroy, but this work actually starts long before this novel is published in 1892. So um, just as the Civil War is ending, in the pages of a newspaper called the Christian Recorder, um, the newspaper of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, a historically black church in the United States, um, publishes a newspaper that like all 19th century newspapers, publishes all kinds of things. Um, we have poetry, we have writing for children, we had advertisements, essays, news, letters to the editor, but also serialized novels. And so in 1865, just as the war is ending, 
another black woman writer named Julia Collins publishes a story in the Christian Reporter, um, a novel called The Curse of Caste or The Slave Bride. And this novel is set up like it's gonna be um, the same kind of tragic story. Actually, it ends with the death of um, a black woman, um, Lena, the enslaved mixed race woman marries this white son of an enslaver. Um, and she dies and is estranged from this guy whose family rejects him. But then the war ends and this novel shifts its focus. And it's actually not about Lena, but it's about Lena's daughter, Claire. And Claire becomes the real protagonist of this story, not Lena, the slave bride. Um, and Lena is, an, is uh, so Claire um, grows up thinking that she's white. Um, she doesn't know anything about her parents. Her mother has died. Um, she doesn't know that her father is living, but he's actually living in Europe and he has been led to believe that she died in infancy. So he doesn't know that she's alive. And by absolute chance, she happens to take a job as the governess in the household of her grandparents, who are these enslavers um, who are estranged from their son. All the enslaved people on this place are like looking at her because she looks like these people who she is biologically related to. Um, and so we're set up, um, her father is on his way back from Europe to come and see her. Um, her terrible grandfather is maybe rethinking um, you know, how he treated his son because of this marriage to this mixed race black person. They're set up to, they love this woman and they're set up to maybe really, really um, embrace her as part of their family. But then Julia Collins dies before she's able to finish writing this novel. So we don't have the ending of this novel at all. Um, we end, it just stops and we get a notice in the paper. We are sorry to inform you that you're not gonna have the end of this novel because we don't have it and this poor woman has died. So, so that's what happens in 1865. In 1869, Frances Harper publishes a novel in the Christian Reporter called Minnie's Sacrifice. And this is another mixed race heroine novel. So Harper by this time in 1869 is already well known for writing poetry and short fiction. This is the first known serialized novel that we have of hers. Um, and she's publishing in the Christian Recorder, a black newspaper for a black audience. And this novel takes up um, mixed race heroine fiction in a different way. And so Minnie, um, like Claire and like some other mixed race heroines before her is the daughter of a mixed race black woman and a white enslaver. She doesn't know about her mother's race or her enslaved history. She's raised as a white child and educated. It sounds familiar. Um, but she learns about her family's history. She comes to identify as a black woman. She actually marries another mixed race black man um, who has an interesting storyline of his own in this novel. Um, and she decides to become active in the Black community and work for racial justice. That sounds kind of familiar, but at the end of this novel, Minnie is lynched by the Klan who are terrorizing the Black community because of their work for Black suffrage. This is uh, you know, a novel published in 1869, kind of after the war, um, you know, post-emancipation, but we're still very much fighting for Black suffrage at this moment. And so here Harper is revising the tragedy. The tragedy of the mixed race heroine is not just a tragedy of her suicide, right? Um, and it's not only about um, her as a kind of sexually imperiled person who's in danger of sexual assault, right? But it's about um, white violence against black communities. And what Harper shows in this tragedy is that um, is, is a little bit different from what um, uh, white anti-slavery and black anti-slavery activists are showing. So while the anti-slavery activists before are kind of showing how even white looking mixed race character figures can people can be enslaved, it isn't that something. Minnie is saying, you know what? Um, even this white looking woman isn't safe from anti-black violence if she does this racial justice work in the black community because black communities aren't safe um, from, this white, from this violence. Um, and so here she's um, showing us in, in some ways how this woman chooses um, to identify with this community and do this work even though she's putting herself in 
uh, danger to do so. And even though she um, dies while doing this work. And then after Minnie's death, what happens is that her husband and this community continues to um, uh, you know, do that work um, in the face of anti-Black violence and in this very uncertain moment um, of, uh, um, you know, of racial justice. Harper is, is um, you know, very clear and familiar with how things are happening during Reconstruction. Um, she knows it might not work out. And then we get to Iola Leroy. By the time Harper writes this novel in 1892, she's in her 60s, this is the last known novel that we have of hers. Um, and it's post reconstruction reconstruction was not a success um, in the terms that we might have wanted it to, to be it did not lead to racial justice. Um, uh, Andrew Johnson president uh, at, at this time generally kind of let um, southern states um, take black um, civil liberties away just as soon as they're granted by the federal government. So this is where we get into Jim Crow era laws um, that are going to suppress the black vote. Um, pretty soon after um, Black people are voted or are granted voting rights at the federal level. Um, but at this point, Harper is writing a different kind of story. Um, this, is a, this is a more hopeful story of, of Black perseverance. Um, and we still see these dangers in this story. Um, it's not vo you know, void uh, of danger. Um, this is a happy ending, um, but it's also, um, you know, uh, in a community that is still working, right? So Harper has her mission. Uh, her she's she's part of a community who is all also also still working towards this mission, um, and and I think it's really interesting how she um, continues to revise um, this this character and revise this genre, um, writing a different kind of story for this mixed race heroine to be in. So it's not just that she commits suicide. Um, because she's not able to, um, you know, fit into white society and has some desire to do that either for her safety or for her, her benefit. It's not just because she is um, inevitably going to be the victim of uh, anti-Black violence, even if she is light-skinned, even if she's white passing, even if she's respectable, um, but um, she has this chance of um, future and this chance of future work. And I think that's really interesting uh, point to Iola Leroy um, that Harper leaves us with um, a different version of this story than is the dominant version. But it's also not a different version of the story. Uh, it's not brand, brand new. So um, we do have other people writing mixed race who communities, who persevere, who um, you know, function in ways that are um, you know, contributing to black activist causes before this. Um, in the anonymous um, novel, uh, A Woman of Color published in London in 1808, we have a woman who could marry this nice white guy and live in England if she wants to, but decides that she's gonna go back to Jamaica and work for her enslaved brothers and sisters, as she says. And that's how we end the novel with her way on her way back to Jamaica, abandoning this guy who was proposed marriage. We have um, short stories um, like a story called Teresa, a Haitian tale, uh, published in the first known African American newspaper, Freedom's Journal, um, in uh, 1827 or 28, um, in which um, a mixed race girl um, during the Haitian Revolution delivers some important information to General Toussaint Louverture, who is, uh, and that helps um, him in the cause uh, of the Haitian Revolution. And the Haitian Revolution is um, this um, Black-led rebellion that leads to the establishment of a, a Black-led nation. So um, the uh, enslaved people overthrow the, the enslaving nation. They overthrow the, the French government in Haiti and Saint-Domingue. Um, and France gives up their colonization of, of this place um, and black people establish for themselves a black led nation. And so we have somebody writing a story in a black newspaper about a mixed race woman who contributes to that and then goes on to live a life with her mother and her sisters. Um, and we have somebody like, you know, the story by Julia Collins. We don't know how things were going to end for um, this woman 
um, in her novel because um, Julia Collins dies before we have the ending of it. But we could see like, you know, the possibility there. This woman might not die. She might go on to live a life and do some things um, uh, either uh, to be incorporated into her white family or not. It's unclear uh, what's going to happen. Um, and so I think Harper, um, like this long line of other Black women writers, sees different possibilities for these figures um, than just to exist in these relationships to white, um, their white family or to white characters. Um, and in stories that aren't just tragic, aren't just meant to teach the reader something about um, uh, these experiences of oppression, but that also um, illustrate something like uh, black communal work in, in this, um, you know, in this historical setting. Thank you. Um, do we have time for some uh, questions or do you have um, uh, Professor Fielder? Um, yeah, we can have some questions. Um, the only other thing I wanted to, to, to talk about involves Dr. Gresham um, and what his deal is uh, and what kind of character I think he is and all of this um, in, in how he matters and Harper's critique, which I think is really interesting. Um, I, yeah, I'm excited about that part, but um, maybe we can take a second because there's a lot there for maybe students to unpack. Um, I personally think um, what's really fascinating with what you're teaching us is that, you know, that Harper was continually revising the story, not just with Iola Leroy, but even earlier on with Minnie's Sacrifice. And then, you know, you, uh, you started this section kind of talking about Julia Collins. Um, what's the title of her novel that was published in the Christian Recorder? Uh, it's called The Curse of Caste um, or The Slave Bride. Um, so, so students, what um, there's a couple of things I wanted to make sure we covered. The Curse of Caste um, or The Slave Bride. So uh, the ways in which, you know, um, oh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you guys, um, watch um, movies and you can kind of see, you know, how one movie kind of like picks up on, on another uh, style of another movie and kind of keeps revising it and changing it in order to kind of like um, reorient their purpose. So I did want students to kind of see that you can see the mixed race heroine as is being continually changed and how it moves from being a tragic figure. Um, and, you know, but the adjustments are, are, um, are, are, are subtle because so in, in, um, in mini sacrifice, Harper changes um, the, the reason of her victimhood, right? As, as what I'm understanding you're saying, like it's not because of, of um, her, her sexual victimization or even um, causing, causing her own death through suicide, but it's through, you know, um, being a, victimized by lynching. And and I didn't know that because, and I think that was important for me because I was wondering when I was picking up Iola Leroy, you know, where is the account of the violence of that time period, which um, students might be familiar with. So I did want to ask students what you thought about uh, what Professor Fielder was saying. Um, any thoughts on um, the changing of the, the, the revising of the version of the mixed race uh, fiction? Anything that stood out to you? Do you have any questions? Maybe I want to ask you guys, um, why do you think um, it would be important to have, you know, um, a figure like Iola Leroy, now that you know that there were all of these other versions um, that, of that character in a previous fiction? And how do you relate to a tragic figure differently than you would to say maybe a heroic uh, um, figure or a victimized figure? So maybe I can pick on some people um, just to hear what your thoughts are. Um, um, I have a question. So, oh, hi. Um, so throughout the lecture, I was constantly thinking about Dr. Gresham's character because um, Ms. Fielder had mentioned that Yola Leroy is not one of these tropes. 
in fact um it has a lot of like characteristics of them of which um dr gresham chases after yola but she could have easily just went with him and um followed that kind of trope but instead she looked for her mom and did her own journey right so my question is um what was the purpose of having dr gresham as like a potential switch to that kind of um story like she could have just easily um had that um black woman's fiction um a free mixed race concubine those kind of tropes why is it that she had hints of that trope but she didn't end with that yeah, I think he's a really important um, part of this because this guy is also a prominent trope in this genre. Um, he hasn't really been discussed um, in the way that the mixed race heroine has, but um, I like to call him the mediocre white suitor um, because this guy is exhausting and he's also kind of familiar um, because this guy is in a lot of these different stories. So in the most popular version of the tragic mixed race heroine story, this guy is a guy. Um, he is also the same kind of guy as Iola's father, Eugene Leroy. So like he, um, these, these guys, they're always underprepared to truly and responsibly love a black woman. They follow the same pattern. Their paperwork is never quite in order. They've not successfully manumitted their wife or their children. When somebody hasn't actually um, uh, freed their enslaved people, if you're in an anti-slavery novel and someone is like, oh, I'm totally gonna free these people as soon as I get back from the bar, that guy's gonna die. <laughs> before he can get this thing to happen, right? So like these guys who don't, uh, who, you know, care about their family, but they haven't yet, you know, arranged for their freedom, um, they always die, just like Eugene Leroy. Um, they leave this wake uh, of, of, of sorrow in their um, irresponsible departure from the scene. So they like, um, uh, you know, they, um, you know, they, care about their family, but they also are, uh, you know, um, in, in many ways fetishizing these, you know, mixed race women. So they care about white standards of beauty um, in this, um, despite their, um, they encourage racial passing. They want to hide their mixed race wives or lovers race. Um, they remain only secret lovers of black women. So they, you know, um, make sure that nobody knows. They facilitate this lack of knowledge. Um, they fall short of doing anything like um, um, articulating this, this, this love in public. Um, their friends and neighbors don't know about this. Their family doesn't know about this. Their family is probably terrible. Um, they miss this opportunity to convert their family to anti-racist views. They don't do that work. Um, they, um, they are lazy, <laughs> um, they are ineffective, um, they are negligent, they are mediocre and sad. And this guy offering his like sad version of this is um, a prominent trope in these stories. Eugene Leroy is this guy. He hasn't, he doesn't have it together. He sets his family up. To fail, to fail. He, he, you know, he, he doesn't have his stuff in order. He's, and, and he lets, you know, he lets his daughter get, in, get be enslaved because he has not um, secured her actual freedom. Um, he can't admit their mother's blackness. Um, he is ashamed of that. Uh, and I think that there's a way in which Dr. Gresham is the same kind of guy. And rather than taking Iola and putting her through the same pattern, we have this moment where, where they have these conversations um, and Iola makes different choices. And so Gresham comes at her like a white savior, right? We, we read that he comes at her with all the manhood and chivalry of his nature, 
right? Like he's going to show up and, oh, I want to take her away from all of this, right? Um, he thinks that he knows what it takes to make her life bright and happy, but he does not know her very well. He has not done his research. What she wants is to be with her family, right? Um, and he is not a substitute for that. And he seems nice. He seems smart. Iola kind of likes him, right? But he has not thought out to consider any of this. Um, he, he, see, he says to her, I can conceive of no barrier too high for my love to surmount. But then Iola can really think of some barriers. So she's like, you know, our babies could look any which way. And he's, oh my goodness, I hadn't even thought about black babies, right? Um, he just hasn't thought this through. Um, and then he's, you know, and then, then he's embarrassed about this. Um, he wants to only do this under concealment. He only wants to do this by hiding her race and making her mother his mother and not telling anybody about this and just passing her off as a white woman. And she's like, yeah, no, I'm not really interested in, in pretending that I'm a white woman for all of this um, because of what that would mean for her. That would mean she couldn't see her family, right? Because it's Iola's grandmother that outs her. Oh, we saw her grandmother was a black woman and therefore we know that she is black. That's how she loses her job. Um, but she's not willing to give up her family in order to pretend to be a white woman and go and live with this one guy who is not enough for her. Um, and so Dr. Gresham is kind of exhausting. He hasn't considered that he's just foisting onto Iola these additional pieces of emotional labor when she's got other problems that are not, you know, I, I want to get married to this guy. He wants to put this, you know, this romantic plot into the middle of this thing. And she's like, I need to go find my mom. You don't know what my priorities are. I have more stuff going on here than to deal with you. <laughs> in this moment. And I don't wanna meet your racist mother. I don't wanna go and be with you and forget about my family. Um, I don't wanna worry about if our children turn out looking black that you're not gonna be able to deal with this because I, have, I know that story already. And I've seen how that happens and it does not work out for people like me. And so Viola makes this different choice. <laughs> and so I think there's a way in which we get this switch Gresham is set up to be like Eugene and we could get that kind of story with her and we could even get that kind of story in which like oh he's like this guys but then it works out and she's able to say pass for white and live out her life in a different way but that's not this kind of story that that Harper is interested in either a white guy who um you know maybe anti-slavery and who you know, is clearly kind of racist, right? He's, you know, he, he hesitates when he learns that Iola is black. Um, maybe this guy isn't the guy to make this happy ending. And so Harper kind of gives us um, that character as like a possibility that she is very deliberately steering us away from. Um, and I think that, I think that in this, there's something really interesting about how Harper critiques not just severe racism, but also white moderate positions. So she's not just like, oh, the Klan is a danger um, and is killing people and that's a problem. But she's also like, middle ground white people need to be better if they're going to be useful in any way to this. And this guy is not it. And Iola and, and Harper um, knows moderate white people from her activist work. And she's critiquing white feminists who don't support black voting rights. She's critiquing the people in her communities um, who she's in conversation with around the same time um, who aren't quite uh, you know, met, making up to those standards. But she's also writing white characters who are doing some of these things too. And so I think it's interesting in this story um, that we don't get this extreme violence, even though that's something that's happening, but we do get this other critique of certain kinds of white people as being, um, you know, insufficient in their anti-racist work, and we can't rely on them as as saviors to do this work, um, and so that's why I think Gresham is kind of 
interesting here. Uh, and I think to readers too, he would be kind of familiar um, because we see what that kind of guy does in this kind of story. Um, you know, it's so, thank you again. It's so com complicated sometimes. And I think maybe students, what I'd like you, I mean, I want some questions from you um, as well, but I hope you're seeing how it's not as simple as just being an anti-slavery or anti-racist person, you know, that there are ways in which even if a novel or a writer is, is try, is, uh, seems to have like good intentions, you know, there are ways in which um, you can see that Harper is pointing out um, that within that you could be hiding um, ideas that are actually racist and harmful. So I wanted to hear from, from students. Um, we've got about 15 minutes um, to, to hear from you. Um, what are some of your questions for Professor Fielder? Give you some time to maybe um, um, gather your, your thoughts. Uh, what are your thoughts about Dr. Gresham? Um, Um, it's, it's me again. <laughs> um, so Professor Fielder, I, I really, I really enjoyed the, your point of the heroine and the main star protagonist having other, having other things to do than romance. Like, because I feel like it is very common when stories are forcing romance down down like, everyone's throat, like force, trying to squeeze romance in the story when the main character or the protagonist has other more important like things to get done. For example, I feel like, I feel like I've heard oversaturated stories over and over again, where it's like the big white knight comes and saves the princess. When in reality, it, like she has, or they have so much other, so much potential as to save themselves and save what they want to do because oh like I said the trope is that someone comes along and romance just happens out of nowhere and then everything is all right when everything is in fact not all right like there's just so much more to this character than romance there's so much more more to this character than sexual tension and i feel like it's very important to mention that like there's romance is not like romance is not the key point in a lot of stuff romance is not what the main idea is overall in stories especially female um where stories where the female is a protagonist where a female is a main character because a woman is so much more than just a sexual object. It, there's so much more than, you know, falling in love with someone and, and you know, that's the end of the story. And I feel like that was a really important key point to point out, so. Thank you, Dina, great. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and this is definitely important to Harper, right? Um, in, in the tragic versions of this trope, it's, um, these are overwhelmingly interested in um, what like male threats are to these women um, in, in terms of sexual violence or um, what guys they're going to be with who are going to be safer or better. But the truth is, is that um, Black women have always written about Black women in ways that did not involve men doing things necessarily. Um, Frances Harper's very first story um, that we have that was published in 1859 when she was still Frances Watkins um, was The Two Offers, published in the Anglo-African Magazine in 1859. And this is a story about a woman who doesn't get married and lives happily ever after. Um, she has other interests and lives a completely fulfilling life. Um, and her friend who gets married, things just don't work out for her because she got married for the sake of getting married and this guy didn't turn out to be great. And so um, 
this is also tied, I think, really, really clearly to um, Harper's work in, um, for voting rights. So around this time, we've got a whole debate as to um, how we might extend voting rights in the United States and whether we're going to get an, and so it turns out that um, Congress is probably not gonna pass an amendment to give both white women and um, black people voting rights because that's too many people. White women are a really big population. Women are like half of everyone. And so um, giving black people, giving black men voting rights seems to be the thing that's gonna happen. That's the 15th amendment to the constitution. Now, while this is all shaking out, women's rights organizations are having an argument as to whether they're gonna support black male suffrage or not. Um, and so some white women like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are complaining that black men are going to get the vote and saying that white women deserve the vote first. People are gonna be arguing for the 15th amendment saying that, um, no, we have to give voting rights to black men now that um, we have had uh, emancipation. This is going to help the black community. They need to have rights as, as just as white men now that people are free. And black women are standing there like, we're here, right? Um, and people like Harper are involved in the suffrage movement from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And we see these conversations that she has in Iola Leroy about, about women's rights um, in these black families, right? Um, and so we can see too how, um, you know, um, marriage can't be the place where women have representation in the government. Right? So like she's, she's for the 15th amendment. Harper supports black men's right to vote. And she is, you know, an advocate of this. But even as she does that, she's like, no, this is not enough. You can't have this depend upon being married to some man. By this time, Harper is a widow. So um, she's only married for a short time before her husband dies. And she spends the vast majority of her life single. Um, and so she's like, this is not enough. I can't, I don't have some man in my, household who's going to vote on my behalf. That's a terrible argument. We need better and we need to argue better for the people in our community. And that means black women have to be having these conversations with black men um, so that they can also support this. Um, and this is banking on a number of things, banking on black men to care more about black women's rights than white women do, which um, you know, in, in some ways turns out to be true because black women have a better access and audience to that. And white women have aligned themselves pretty clearly with white supremacy at this particular point in time, Katie Stanton and um, uh, Susan B. Anthony actually campaigned with a white supremacist for white women's suffrage against the 15th Amendment. That's just so, uh, just so blows my mind. Uh, um, a moment in which Harper is, yeah, Har and Harper's like, you know, kind of a critique of like marriage being the thing mm -hmm. to solve anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, so even though we have this marriage, you know, even though we have romance and whatnot happening in Isle of the Roy, it's interesting how it's not central. It's not the only thing that's going on. And in many ways, it serves as a stage for Harper to like have these feminist arguments <laughs> with this guy. <laughs> and so they're having, you know, so she's like putting up these whole conversations about how like, you need to have this conversation in your household about women's rights. <laughs> um, and so it's not just about like the romance plot really even 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 where we have this um and i think that's something really interesting about her um and about you know and, and, and black women are often going to write about things that are not you know just just the romance plot right so everything doesn't um doesn't have to be oriented around men and so when we start to think then about these women's relationships in these in these stories their relationships with other women, we can see some other things that are, that are going on, right? And so Dr. Gresham's important here, but also um, Iola's relationship with Miss Delaney, right. her sister-in-law. This is a dark-skinned black woman who, you know, who's fairly radical and has some really good ideas herself and, um, or her relationship with, um, you know, with, in these, uh, you know, uh, formerly enslaved Black women who are not uh, formally educated, but who Harper depicts as um, 
being legitimate intellectual contributors to their community. And so this highly educated, you know, under like even in white woman terms, woman has to learn from these formerly enslaved black women who can't read, who don't have formal education, who under, who still understand some things. And so, you know, um, while other people are depicting black women like that only as ridiculous, only as ignorant, only, you know, according to these racist and sexist tropes, um, Harper has to recognize that like, no, like we all have to be in community with one another and we all have to be in conversation with one another. And um, all of these women have something to add to this conversation and can be intellectual contributors to that conversation. And so I think, you know, like moving away from just like heteronormative conversations. If you, you could apply like the Bechdel test to this, you know, the thing that you think about a movie, like are there two women who have names who talk to each other about something that isn't a man? Um, could tell you like whether, like how feminist this movie is, right? Um, and so Harper's novel has women talking to other women about things that aren't just men. Uh, and so I think she shows us through those conversations too how these people have a lot more going on than just romance. Um, I, I'm not sure students know about the Bechtel test, um, but uh, I, I know Professor Fielder was explaining it to all of you students about how you can, you can check to see how, you know, um, anti, uh, how feminist or not a particular uh, text might, film might be if you see the, if you can track you know, scenes where women are not just talking to another man, but to, or to the kind of romantic figure, but to other women in the in the um, and that that being represented. And I did notice that about the relationship with Miss Delaney and Iola. Um, and I did want to um, maybe give the last um, couple of minutes for students who, uh, if you have any other thoughts and questions before we we wrap up. I mean, I have my obviously I'm lots of questions, but, you know, I wanted to know um, for students, what are your last questions or thoughts for Professor Fielder? Um, you know, how did you react to the romance plots? You know, did you, um, did you feel like that was important to you? And now that you've heard this, I'm actually curious to hear what you guys think now of, of the romance plots. You know, it, in some ways I read it maybe incorrectly because I saw like marriage being such an important part of the novel like it ends with like three married two marriages um so I almost felt like oh, okay Harper believes in the institution of marriage as a way to really you know you uh, bind up the family um but it's more complicated I think than that um so students do you have any um last questions or thoughts I want to give you some time um I have a comment. Hi, my name is Lisa. Um, I think um, it's really interesting to hear about like um, it, the story about uh, you're saying about a woman that like, didn't get married and ended up happier than the woman that did get married. Because I think um, when I heard, first heard of that, it kind of reminded me of um, the Shakespeare novel or like film, I guess, um, Taming of the Shrew. That mm -hmm. um, I watched in my Shakespeare class, and it's like um, throughout the movie. Wait, hold on. So basically, like, throughout the movie, I was, like, interested in it because um, Catherine, the um, actress or whatever, like, she didn't exactly need a husband, yet, like, society <laughs> was talking, um, just pressuring it on her for, like, no good reason to the point where she didn't even allow her sister to get married because of it. And throughout the movie is basically, like, I felt it as a suppression of her personality and of her character. I didn't really enjoy it that much. But it was just like seeing how much marriage was important to women back then, not important, but just like not even to them, but just to society, like being a married woman was like the ideal or like you were like um, approved or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very empowering now to see where we come as a society with that kind of stuff and to hear stories not revolving around men and to hear about independent women who don't exactly need men and just are doing fine on their own. Mm -hmm. And also I wanted to touch on the fact um, the trope trope characteristics you were mentioning earlier, I think it's really interesting to see that like throughout history, 
um, the kind of reusal of tropes and stuff like that has been a common thing. Like, I think we can reflect on, like, some anime watches out there, like Sailor Moon and stuff like that, the magical girl tropes and how they've been, like, evolved throughout time, throughout shows like Miraculous and whatnot. And I think um, it's always interesting to hear, like, um, a storyteller trying to take those tropes and make it something different because taking something that's already been done and then still making it, like, in a new and re innovative way is always interesting to hear about. So I really enjoy the fact that, like, um, Harper with um, her story chose to be kind of original with the trope, despite like um, being another like um, story of, sorry, of that characteristic, but also making it her own in a sense, as well as um, tying in her feminist values, especially at a time like that, where like marriage and stuff is important for a woman, like um, societal wise, and just like combining it all to make like this kind of um, empowerment story and revolving around the love story. Those also felt like kind of, they felt kind of forced a little bit to me just like um especially dr gresham like she obviously wasn't interested in most of the um most of the like um male romance leads in there but it just seemed kind of like like um to me like how do i say this Wait. like because in every like romance or like romance novel and stuff like that you have like options you have interests so it's like the author is pushing these interests on um Iola and she was like, no, 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 let me focus on my goals. No, 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 let me focus on my goals. So it's interesting to see like um her not just swoon into the first guy that meets her um as nice to her arm and stuff like that. And to have like her own personal mindset and goals still set. Like even like in Disney films and stuff like that, I think we see that trope a lot where like the whole um the man comes and saves um princess and stuff like that, even though that's kind of being changed a little bit more, thankfully. But it's just cool to see that she remained on her goal and like on her path that she wanted to accomplish. And then when she finished that, then she's like, okay, time for time for like other things, you know. That was great. And also to note that Harper was how many hundreds of years before Disney, right? Um, Professor Fielder, did you want to? I think that was great. I think that's actually a really great um, summary of Taming of the Shrew. Catherine does not exactly need a husband is I think an, a, an excellent take on what's going on there. But I, I, you get at a really important point about um, how Harper write, is writing this woman. Um, she's got goals. She's got interests. Um, she's got standards, right? Um, and so she doesn't have to take this nice white guy, <laughs> right, who, who, the first one who comes along. Um, she doesn't have to take anybody. Right. And so when she finally does get married, we can see that this is not just like, you know, because she th thinks she needs to or something, um, because she doesn't have anything else going on for her, because um, she has enough to do. Um, and, and, and so I think it gives us a fuller picture of this. Um, and I think one of the important points to, 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 to mention here is that um, in the other versions of this that we've that I've been discussing, A lot of the simplistic versions of this are people who are not Black women writing Black women. And so it's very important and interesting that we've got Black women writing Black women in ways that are more complex and variable and take different things into consideration and that understand that they're not just waiting around for some white guy to come and save them. Um, at, you know, at, or that they have other things going on besides marriage, even if marriage is tied to something like their voting representation, um, that they're active people and contributors to their communities, that they have intellectual capability and can contribute to political conversations, even if they lack the right to vote, um, they are, you know, contributing to those conversations. Um, and so I think here we see something very, very, very different than um, a lot of the Black women characters written by Black men or white women or white men in which Black women are acted upon in various ways and aren't very interesting as characters um, because Iola has got this, this fullness. Even, and even if those, those people are protagonists of the stories, even if they're the main character, they might not be very interesting <laughs> um, in the way these other authors write them. Um, but Harper is like writing a full black woman with a full black woman's life who has like, you know, um, issues related to, you know, uh, misogynist and anti-black oppression, but 
um, who, who's got a lot of things going on um, and who is an active participant in her world and who's negotiating all of this, you know, and, and not just falling into, you know, uh, the trope. And so we can, and then we also in this, we see there are lots of different kinds of black women. Um, and so it's important, I think, as she writes this mixed race heroine that she also writes dark skinned black women, that she also writes black women who don't have formal education um, who have to be in conversation with this person in order for her to be a part of the Black community. Um, she can't just like stand in for the Black community. She's not just representative of them. Um, she is one person who is part of a larger group of people, not all of whom are like her. And um, she has to be positioned to be able to learn from those other people as well in this and not just, you know, teaching or something. And so I think that's, that's also really important for her. Um, I'm going to say thank you to our guests. Um, students, can you join me in um, virtual clapping for Professor Fielder? Um, thank you so much for your time with us. Um, I do have to dismiss the students um, for a period, their next period. Um, Students, I look forward to seeing your comments on the Padlet. Um, I think um, I know a lot of you are, are um, have thoughts and questions as well, and um, might be a slow burn in terms of articulating. But I did want to thank um, uh, Cassandra and Alicia and Dina for um, your questions as well and being part of this um, our discussion, um, and to all of our guests. Um, again, thank you, students, and thank you, Professor Fielder. Thank you all so much.